he was a son. He was a, a baby adored by his mother. He was a brother and he was a friend. He was a man. He was a carpenter working with his father. He was a teacher who spoke to thousands. He was a healer. He opened blind eyes, he opened deaf ears, he raised people from the dead. He was a radical. He was a friend to the outcast and rejected by the religious. He was bold, he backed out from no one. He was brilliant, he confounded the wise. He was loved, but he was hated. He was tempted, but did no wrong. He was innocent, but found guilty. He was forsaken. He was beaten beyond recognition. They ripped out his beard, they shoved thorns into his head. He was battered, bruised, and broken. His hands and his feet were nailed to a cross. He was crucified, he was murdered. He was the God of all nations. He was our high priest, he was God come to earth. He was the savior of our universe. He was a great light shining in the dark like sun over the horizon. He was. Hello, hello. Welcome to MBI Church Online and our study of the Gospel of John. Um, currently, as I'm actually speaking to you, it's October of 2020. And uh, by the time we actually release this video, it's going to be November of 2020. So we're actually in the middle of a presidential campaign in the year 2020. So by the time this, act this video is actually released, it could be that uh, President Trump has been reelected or former Vice President Joe Biden has has won the election. So I just don't know how that outcome will come. But the, the whole campaign season got me thinking about presidential vi visits. Back in um, June of this year, President Trump came to Tulsa here in Oklahoma for a presidential campaign rally. And then that made me think about, well, when's the last time that a president had come here? And, and that was actually back in 2015 when his predecessor, President Obama, came actually to my hometown in Durant, Oklahoma, and he was there to discuss a technology agenda. So what, got, what I really got to thinking about was the process of moving a president, you know, because they're a very important person. And so I did some research, and the cost for moving a president, and this is from a report of June 2017, it cost about 2000 $614 for every minute that the commander in chief in the United States uh, travels. And for example, the president from the White House, he could be at the UN headquarters there in New York in about an hour, but that trip would cost $156,000, actually over $156, because that trip, it would include a helicopter ride from the White House to Andrews Air Force Base. From there, he would fly Air Force One into most likely uh, JFK airport, and then he'd take another helicopter ride from JFK to the uh, heliport there in Manhattan, and then the motorcade would have a short uh, drive to the um, UN headquarters. And in addition to his armored limousine, there's also an identical limousine uh, for security reasons. That way they don't know exactly which one the president's in. There's about 20 to 30 motorcycles that accompany a presidential motorcade, about 40 to 50 other vehicles, and then also over 100 people. And that wouldn't include how many people from the New York Police Department would be involved as well. And so make no mistake, as a nation, we need to protect our, our president. He's one of the most important people in the world, regardless of you know, if it's someone we voted for or not. And, and so we have to protect them. And so it takes that kind of entourage to move the president. And so my purpose today, again, it's not to be political, even though we're in the middle of a political election, but it got me thinking about John chapter 12, an event that happened in John chapter 12. And I want to uh, contrast a presidential motorcade with this certain event that happened in John chapter 12. But before I get to that, I want to look at some other passages in John because, you know, like political, ca political candidates, when they're on the campaign trail, they try to give you images 
of who they are or who they want you to think they'll be. Like they may say, you know, tough on crime or I'm going to fight to save the environment, those sorts of things. Well, likewise, the Apostle John in his gospel, he gives us different pictures and images of who Jesus is. And so I want to take a look at a few of those. In the first verse of the book of John, John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. So we see that whoever this person that's being called the Word, that they existed, they've been around forever, right? And that they're also with God, but they also are God. And then it goes on to say in verse 2 that He existed in the beginning with God. Verse 3, He created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. And that's talking about Jesus, and I'll show you how we know that in just a minute. But I like to see that Jesus is being identified there as instead of commander-in-chief, the commander and creator. Verse 4, it says, "...the Word gave life to everything that was created." and His life brought light to everyone. And in verse 5, the light shines in the darkness, and darkness can never extinguish it. So we see Jesus here as the Word. We see Him as God. We see Him as Creator. We see Him as the giver of life and the giver of light. And then in verse 10 of the same chapter, it says that He came into the world, the very world He created, but the world didn't recognize Him. And then in verse 14, it says, So the Word became human, and made his home among us, and he was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. So we see that Jesus put off his godly deity, his role as creator, his role as commander and creator, and he came to this earth and he took on human flesh. But get this, it says that he was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. So there's a contrast right there with presidents. You know, I believe that every president is a good person and that they have good qualities, but like all of us, they're human and they have flaws and there's none of us that can say that we're full of unfailing love and unfailing faithfulness. But here we have Jesus identified not only as God, but God in human flesh now and God that's with us, but He still is full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And then in John, still in chapter 1, verse 29, um, He's identified as the Lamb of God. So now we're about to meet not just, you know, this is the Apostle John's book, but we're about to read about John the Baptist. And as John the Baptist sees Jesus, it says the next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, He is the one I was talking about when I said, a man is coming after me who is far greater than I am, for he existed long before me. I did not recognize him as the Messiah, but I have been baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. So John said at first he didn't recognize Jesus as the Messiah. But, you know, John was prophesied to be the one that would make straight the path of the Messiah. So part of his role in baptizing all the people, he, he was going out saying repent because the kingdom of God is head, because he was preparing the nation of Israel for the coming of that chosen king, that chosen Messiah, and that, that one day He would be revealed to Israel, that He would fully be revealed. And so then in the same chapter, John 1, verse 32, it says, Then John testified, I saw the Holy Spirit descending like a dove from heaven and resting upon Him. I didn't know He was the one, but when God sent me to baptize with water, He told me, The one on whom you see the Spirit descend and rest is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I saw this happen to Jesus, so I testify that He is the chosen one. You know, just like the Old Testament Scriptures prophesied that one day the Messiah would come, they also prophesied that John the Baptist would come. So he was a person that was prophesied to be, and so his testimony has a very superior validity to it. And so when he says that he saw the Spirit descend like a dove upon Jesus, that validates that Jesus is that chosen one of God. And so we've seen all through this first chapter of John, you know, the different attributes of Jesus that He carried in different validations, like He was the Word, He was God, He was Creator. Um, 
he became flesh. He was full of unfailing love. And, and we know that now he's also the one that the Spirit descended on. And so already in this chapter 1, he's been validated by this whole chapter. And if we back up to verse 29, John the Baptist said that, I have been baptizing with water so that he might be revealed to Israel. And so we, we come to John chapter 2, and Jesus and his mother, Mary, they have went to a wedding in Cana in Galilee, and you know the famous story, they ran out of wine, Mary comes to Jesus, and so in verse 2 of John chapter 2, Jesus says, Dear woman, that's not our problem, Jesus replied. And then he says, My time has not yet come. You know, and he's primarily there, he's talking about his time of being the bridegroom. You know, at the end of the age, he will come back and get his bride, the church, and we'll draw together in eternity. So he's primarily talking about that. But he's also telling Mary that, look, it's not time for me to be fully revealed. And we would see that at various times, uh, Jesus would reveal himself to various people. And for example, in our study of the gospel, Molly talked about the Samaritan woman at the well that we find in John chapter 4. You know, he actually tells her that he is the Messiah. And so there are incidents like that. But, and I mean a big but, there would be a big reveal that would soon come. And so we find that big reveal in the 12th chapter of John. Matter of fact, in the 12th verse of the 12th chapter of John. And so most theologians believe that once his ministry began at the age of 30, that Jesus went to three Passovers. And uh, some people believe maybe four, but... This would at least be his third Passover once his ministries began. It would also be his final Passover. And so here we are in John chapter 12, verse 12. It says the next day, the news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down through the road to meet him. And they shouted, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord hell to the king of Israel. You know, and that's actually quoting uh, two different Old Testament passages. It quotes uh, Psalm 118, verse 25, and, and also verse 26. And then also Zephaniah 3.15, which reads, For the Lord will remove His hand of judgment, and will disperse the armies of your enemy. And the Lord Himself, the king of Israel, will live among you. At last your troubles will be over and you will never again fear disaster. And so, see, but they thought that their enemy was wrong. They thought that the armies, that Caesar was their, their enemy, and that the armies of their enemy were the armies of Rome. They believed that the Messiah would come as a great military leader, and that he would drive out the Romans, and that Israel would once have been be an independent nation, and it would be a theocracy but they were looking at this from the wrong perspective. Their true enemy was Satan. And the troubles that they actually faced was that sinful nature that they were born with that happened when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. And so really the Messiah was coming to fix that. But because they were looking for the wrong type of Messiah, they would miss this grand entry that we're about to look at. But there were other clues in Scripture that God gave them, that they should have recognized the Messiah coming into Jerusalem. So in verse 14 of John 12, we read, Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy that said, and this is verse 15, Don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming, riding on a donkey's colt. So see, that was prophesied in Zechariah 9.9. So God, had, had, out of His mercy, gave them another clue that the Messiah one day would come in and he would be riding on a donkey. Some of the people recognized him. They were the ones that put the uh, palm branches down on the road and the ones that shouted, you know, you know, praises to his name. But, you know, many of those people also in just a few days would be shouting crucify. But most of Jerusalem didn't recognize him. Most of Jerusalem wasn't there. But think of the contrast here of the commander and creator riding on a donkey, 
on a dirt road that's covered in palm branches compared to the U.S., the United States Commander-in-Chief with his big entourage of people. It's amazing to think that the God of the universe, the God that made the universe, humbled himself to the point of riding on the back of a donkey. And so, and again, I'm not bashing our motorcade. It's important we protect the life of our president. That's a necessary thing, but it's just amazing to, to think about that the one that created the universe, the one that would bring salvation to humanity, came in on the back of a donkey. And so, but though it doesn't seemingly, it, it, seem, it doesn't seem to be as glorious as that of a huge motorcade of a political leader like the President of the United States, in the spiritual realm, it was. In the spiritual realm, this was a huge event. But what is different also about this event compared to the presidential motorcade is that, as we've already seen, it was long prophesied to occur, which again validates Jesus as the Messiah. So let, let's look at verse 16 of John 12. It says his disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. But after Jesus entered into his glory, they remembered what had happened and realized that these things had been written about him. So it occurred to even them afterwards, wait, this was a fulfillment of Scripture. But you know what, what's amazing here is not only did Zechariah in chapter 9, verse 9, predict this event, but somewhere 13 to 1400 years before Zechariah, and then also roughly 1900 years before Jesus would actually ride into Jerusalem on the colt of the donkey, Israel, who was previously known as Jacob, and this is found in Genesis 49, he was on his deathbed about to die, and so he gathered all his sons and his two grandsons around him, and he prophesied over each one of them. And of Judah, who was one of his sons, in Genesis 49.10 we read that Jacob said the scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from his descendants, until the coming of the one to whom it belongs, the one whom all the nations will honor. And then he gives this clue in verse 11. He ties his foal to a grapevine, the colt of his donkey, to a choice vine. And so Jacob was saying that there would be a chosen king that would come, and he would carry that holy scepter and that he would come from the tribe of Judah just as Jesus did, but he would also be riding on the foal of a donkey. And, and the references to the grapevine, because it says to a grapevine and then the colt of his donkey to a choice vine, is also a reference to the Holy Spirit. We saw where John the Baptist said that God had told him the one that the, the, the dove descends on is the one that will baptize in the Holy Spirit. And so that Jesus would also bring the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to humanity. And so, you know, the grapevine, the wine, those are symbolic of that. And so, but one last distinctive here to contrast this event with the presidential motorcade is that, you know, the motorcade, as it should, is designed to protect the life of the president. But Jesus with his small entourage, was actually being ushered into his death, which he would willingly die. And so it's fitting that the Creator would be riding on the back of a donkey, which is also known as a beast of burden. You know, donkeys, camels, mules, even um, some huskies like in Alaska, things that carry loads on their back are known as beasts of burden. And so before he could ascend to his royal throne, because Jacob had said the one that carries the royal scepter, you know, he had to also be transformed into the sin bearer and die in our place. In Isaiah 53, 4, Isaiah writes, yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for our sins. And so Isaiah is saying that he put his, our weaknesses, he took our sorrows, he took our burdens, and he placed them on his back. And that the people at this day and time 
they thought that he was being punished by God. That's why we hear them hold insect or insults at him when he's on the cross. Remember, they say things like, if you're truly the son of God, then, then have him remove you or, you know, things like that because they mocked him thinking he wasn't who he said he was. They were thinking that his persecution was something that he had sown and he was reaping because of his own actions. But reality, he was putting their burdens upon himself. He, in reality, he was putting our burdens upon himself. And so Isaiah goes on to say in chapter 53, verse 5, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. So the weight of that burden you know, we always we think about him dying for our sins, but we don't think about our burdens being upon him as well. And so he says that he was crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole, and he was whipped so we could be healed. So while Israel didn't recognize it, they should have. And we still don't recognize it ourselves, because if we did, it would change our lives. And we would live our life differently. And, w- and we're going to come back to that toward the end. But I, w- I want to move on here. Still, I'm back in John chapter 12 now. And so Jesus has made his grand entry. And so picking up in um, John 12, verse 23, um, what has happened here now, this is after he's made his grand entry. So you got to really think about this and put this in perspective. You know, the Messiah has been revealed now. He's come into Israel in his grand entry. And so some Greeks come to Andrew or Philip, I forget which one, and then in turn, the other one went to the other one and and told him, but the Greeks wanted to see Jesus. So Andrew and Philip, they come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, these Greeks want to meet you. These Greeks want to see you. You know, and sometimes Jesus, the way he answers questions, the things he does is just baffling. You know, they come to him, These guys want to meet you. And Jesus replied, verse 23, Now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into His glory. I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone, but its death will produce many new kernels, a plentiful harvest of new lives. So what kind of answer is that to these guys want to meet you? But what Jesus was saying was, look, if you really want to see me, this is how you can see me. This is going to show you who I am. I just had my grand entry as Messiah, but now what's going to happen is like a kernel of wheat, I'm going to fall to the ground and I'm going to die. But because I die, I'm going to bring life, just like it was prophesied in in John chapter 1 that he brings life and light. And so, moving on, in verse 28, an audible voice. After Jesus had prayed, asking the Father to glorify Himself, God said, I will, I have, and I will, but He audibly validates Jesus again. So again, we get more validation that Jesus is that chosen one, the Messiah. And then moving on, after this validation in verse 32, He says, and when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw everyone to myself. So after his grand entry into Jerusalem on the beast of burden, Jesus has now predicted both his death and his manner of death. Because by saying the lifting up, he was pointing to the cross that he was about to endure. You know, and, and with telling them that as a grain of wheat falls to the ground, if it dies, it produces life. But if it doesn't, um, it doesn't produce life. You know, I planted a garden this year, and I've got seeds left over. And those seeds are in a packet in my drawer. And until I put them in the ground, they're never going to grow anything. They're just going to be a seed. So there's two parts of that. It's got to be a seed, but it's got to die and fall to the ground. And But we, you know, I love this time of year in Oklahoma. You know, we're not... We're not as big of a wheat state as Kansas, but wheat is one of our chief crops, and, and we plant winter wheat. And so this time of year right now, you can actually see you know, the wheat starting to sprout, and then ranchers will put um, cows out on that wheat, and they kind of keep it grazed down throughout the winter and the fall. 
and uh, you know, and then the cows get the thick coat during the winter. It's just really beautiful to see. And then springtime rolls around, and then they take the the cows off of that wheat, and then the wheat begins to grow, and then it turns that amber co color, and then it's time to harvest it. And so, because single seeds have fell, they've created more wheat, and they've also you know fed cows off of that same crop of wheat. So. It's a life-sustaining process because some grains of wheat fell to the ground and died. And so likewise, we are those new kernels of wheat that have been produced by his death. And then in John 12, 25, Jesus says, those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their life in this world will keep it for eternity. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my servants must be where I am, and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. You know, unlike Jesus, we're not required to die physically upon the cross. Though if he tarries in his second coming, all of us are going to die a physical death. And then some of us may even die as martyrs. But like Jesus, we are required to die to ourselves in order to bring God glory and others into his kingdom. His death did multiple things. His death destroyed the punishment and death sentence that came to us because of sin. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, mankind received a punishment of death. His death removed that punishment if we receive Him as our Savior. His death also destroyed the power of our sinful nature if we receive Him. Then, we, then that sinful nature no longer has power over us. But we have to choose to die daily to our own selfish desires. We have to die to our own selfish agendas. And that even includes our, our opinions. Um, our political stances can be a hindrance. You know, we're, we're part of this nation. We need to be good citizens. That requires not only voting, but educating ourselves in our vote. So I'm not talking about burying our hand, head in the sand. What I'm talking about is promoting our opinions or our political stances before we promote the gospel of our Savior. You know, even our philosophies of ministry can be something that needs to die in us. A, a guy named Arthur Blessed, who carried a cross around the world, he had a great ministry going in Hollywood in the 60s. And then God told him to carry a cross around the world. And he said that he had his own vision, a ministry, and he had to lay that down because of Jesus' vision for his life. And he said, now my, my vision of ministry extends no further than the next person that I come in contact with. So all of these things that encompass who we are need to be laid at our Savior's feet. And then he is free. You know, just like that kernel of wheat, it has to fall to the ground and die because then it can produce life. And then Jesus is free to pick up anything we lay down and hand it back to us. Some people are called to go into politics. You know, some people are called to different things. Um, but we have to lose ourselves within Him and let Him define who we are and what we're to do. I love the... Um, song by Lauren Daigle called Once and for All. And it, um, the chorus of it says, Oh, let this be where I die, my Lord with thee crucified. Be lifted high as my kingdoms fall, once and for all, once and for all. You know, and that song is really just a prayer that she's praying as she sings. And, but I love that line um, that I just read, Be lifted high as my kingdoms fall. Our kingdoms need to fall like those grains of wheat to the ground. And then God can produce life in us. And, you know, um, we wish we could die once and for all. But that's a hard thing to happen. But that needs to be our prayer daily, that today be the day that I finally die, Lord. And so we need to copy what she's saying and make that prayer daily. But however, dying to ourselves is not enough because that will only lead to us being walking dead. You know, we're, we're not capable of dying to ourselves on our own anyway. But if we just die to ourselves, 
then that means we're apathetic to everything, including ourselves, and we're just we're walking dead. Plus, when left unchecked, when left on its own, when we don't have help from another higher power, then our selfful, sinful flesh will always find a way to resurrect itself. The only way we can stay dead to ourselves is by allowing Jesus to live fully within us. I'll say that again. We stay dead to ourselves only by allowing Jesus to live fully within us. And so as I'm wrapping up, I want to give you some things on how do we do that? How do we allow Jesus to continually live within us? And John gives us some more clues. Uh, We need to continually come to Jesus. John chapter 5, verse 39, Jesus says, You search the Scriptures because you think that they give you eternal life, but the Scriptures point to me, yet you refuse to come to me to receive this life. So we have to come to Him, and we have to come to Him daily. We have to learn to continually cling to Jesus. John 15, verse 5, Jesus says, Yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. Anything that produces fruit is alive. You know, if something's dead, it can't produce fruit. So we, when we have His life, then we're fruitful. But the way we get His life is being connected to Him. That's why He says, those who remain in Me. You know, think about a vine with its branches. They are connected and joined together. So when we cling to Jesus, then we're joined to Him. And so we need to be clinging to Him daily. We need to come to Him daily. We need to cling to Him daily. And we need to continually be cleansed by Jesus. You know, we're, we've been looking at John chapter 12. We've seen His great entry. He's told the Greeks how to see them, to see him, that He's going to be dying. But because He dies, um, it'll bring life to many people. And then in the next chapter, John 13, on the night before He dies, He washes the feet of His disciples. I mean, how would you spend... You know you're going to die in just a few hours. What would you do with your time? Would you binge Netflix, you know, go to your favorite restaurant? What, what would you spend it, your time doing? Would you be washing the feet of those around him? But this, that's what he did. But Peter was objecting to it. And so in John 13, verse 8, Peter, John 13, verse 8 says, No, Peter protested, you will never wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. So we have to allow him to cleanse us because we have stuff in us that needs to come out. And so we have to come to him daily. We have to cling to him daily. And when we feel frustrated, when we feel weak, when we feel afraid, when we feel like he might be mad at us because we did something stupid and in our nature is to run from him, that's when we really need to come to Him. That's when we really need to cling to Him. And that's when we have to allow Him to cleanse us so that His life can dwell in us. And then we have to learn to continually listen to and obey Jesus. In John 10, verse 27, He says, My sheep listen to My voice. I know them, and they follow Me. So first thing, right in the middle, it says, I know them. You know, He knows us better than we know us. He knows me better than I know myself. And so should I trust my life with my own decisions, in my own opinion, in my own vision of how my life should go, or should I trust His over mine? And that's what that dying looks like. I lay all that, the the being the God of my life and ruling my own decisions, I lay that down, and I let Him take that role. And because I do, I've died to myself, and I've allowed His life to come within me. And then He also says here that my sheep listen to my voice. So we're not abandoned. We're not left on our own to guide ourselves. We can hear Jesus. Even if you don't feel like you've ever heard Jesus speak, you can hear Jesus. He says that my sheep listen to my voice. You can only listen to a voice that you recognize. And that comes from spending time with Him 
but he makes himself available to us. And then he says at the end of this that they follow me. You know, to follow him is a decision to obey him. To follow him is a decision to go wherever he leads you. And so that's because we've laid our lives down and put it in his control. And so it's imperative that we learn to come to Jesus daily, that we learn to cling to Jesus daily, that we learn to allow him to cleanse us daily, and that we learn to continually listen and to obey Jesus. Because not only does it impact our lives, but when we do that, like those grains of wheat that fall to the ground and produce life, there's a whole harvest of souls that's dependent on it. And there's also, you know, we've been looking at John 12 about Jesus' grand entry into Jerusalem, but there's another grand entry that's called His second coming that the Bible predicts. And whether you think it's going to happen or not, it will happen. And the Bible tells us to be ready for that. And unlike His first coming, where so many people missed His first coming, the Bible tells us that this second coming cannot be missed. Um, in fact, in Matthew 24, verse 27, Jesus talking about that second return, He says, For as the lightning flashes in the east and shines to the west, so it will be when the Son of Man comes. So lightning that comes from where I'm standing east is this way and west that way. Lightning that comes from all the way over here to all the way over there can't be missed by anyone. That's the whole sky being covered. And no one's going to miss it. And more importantly, no one's going to miss the effects that happen because of that coming. Um, for us, our redemption in Him will be made complete those that have chosen Him as our Savior, that have believed on Him in our heart, our redemption is finally going to be made complete. I mentioned in John 2 where He told Mary that my time has not come. That's when Him, the bride, or the groom, will come get us, the church, His bride, and we will spend eternity together. What a glorious time that's going to be because of that second return that you can't miss. But it also means that those that aren't within Him. Those that haven't made Him Lord of their life, at that time they'll be cast out into outer darkness. That's the other reality, and that's the sad reality, and that's why we, His church, have work to do. And so in closing, I want to look at one last verse in John, John chapter 11, verse 25, because we need to make this personal application, each of us. And so Jesus is um, at Mary and Martha's, and also in John 11, Lazarus had been raised from the dead, and so he's visiting with Martha. So verse 25 of John 11, it says, Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. So do you hear that? So even after dying, you can have life, which for us, that, that has several meanings. When we die in this life and pass to the next life, we have eternal life. Or when He comes back to get us, our, our bodies will just be remade and we'll live again. But it also means when we choose to die to ourselves in this life, then we will live because we get His life which is much better than any life we could choose for ourselves. And in John 11, verse 26, Jesus goes on to say, Everyone who lives in me and believes in me will never die. And then he gets personal. And he says, Do you believe this, Martha? And so now I want you to turn that question on yourself, but instead of Martha, insert your name and ask yourself, do you believe this? Because the way to live is to die to self and to let Him live within us. So after turning that question on yourself, what's your answer? Do you believe this or do you not believe this? Because if you don't believe this, you need to rewind this video 
And look at all the scriptures I've shown you. Just these alone prove Jesus who, who it is. But if not, find more. Because it's imperative that you learn to believe in your heart that Jesus is who He says He is and that Jesus is who the Bible says He is. Because it has eternal consequences. But if your answer is yes, I believe this, then I have some more questions for you. How does this change your view of God and Jesus? And how does this change the way that you will treat others, even your enemies, even the person at work that gets on your nerves, the person that family reunions that you, you, you just can't stand for whatever reason? You know, and I think it's important that you write these questions down with your answers. So how does this change your view of God? How does this change the way that you will treat others? And how does this change the way that you will live your life from this moment forward? And then the fourth question I have for you, who can you share this with this week? Because it's important that you get it for yourself. Remember, lives are at stake. Souls are at stake. It's important that you share this this week with at least one person. And I challenge you to do that. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for giving your life to not only break the power of sin from our life, but also that we can have you both in heaven and on this side of eternity. Please help us to truly die to ourselves, so that we can fully experience your love and life and learn to share that love and life with others. Lord, you know everyone who is watching or who will watch this message. So I just ask that you touch them as only you can. In your precious name, amen. Thank you. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring.